Did you like my theme music? Yes. Wasn't that nice? Uh, it just started when I walked in here. Um, so uh, Paul was here before, Paul Snively, uh, 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 teaching logic, and uh, he went over a little bit, so people are having their break. But I'm going to go ahead and start rolling slowly, just so we try to catch up a little bit, but I'll, I'll kind of drag it out a little bit. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard the story of, uh, at one point, uh, Paul Phillips uh, nicknamed uh, John Pretty, John Pretty Slow. So uh, <laughs> I decided to call this collections pretty slow because I'm not thinking about performance at all, just uh, usability. And uh, what, uh, what this talk is about is a uh, work in progress uh, that turned into a collections library, sort of not uh, on purpose, called Scholastic Collections. It's in the Feature Equisets branch of the Scala Test repo because that's where I do Scholastic stuff. Um, and I really think that uh, people need to use the standard collections library. So this is a, uh, just uh, an experiment uh, to sort of try out ideas where maybe uh, if some of them work out, they could be uh, incorporated into the standard library. That's really the, the point of it. Um, so normally when I work uh, on uh, open source, I wear the straight jacket of compatibility, which is I care very much about not breaking code. Um, and I think that, uh, that it's important um, well, certainly for me, for Scala tests, I try to keep it very stable. Um, but I also want to make things better. And I think that's one of the things I like about Scala culture is it, it kind of has that culture. Scala itself uh, is used pretty widely now. And so uh, uh, we worry about binary compatibility, not just source compatibility. Um, but we're still trying to make things better. But there's a tension between those two. And um, what... Uh, that is different, I think, from Java culture is Java culture deprecates things, uh, but they never remove them. And what we do is eventually we remove things. And so uh, what I think that gives users is even though it's painful to fix broken code, like you get a deprecation warning and you just want to ignore it and keep doing your thing, uh, it does actually, there, there's, sort of, there's a cost to fixing broken code, but there's also a cost over time of not removing things because yeah, the complexity accrues. So I think you, can, you need to worry about both, but you also need to take care of both. And so, um, so very rarely, I think we still should break source code. And the one thing I, I kind of see maybe happening in the Scala community is that uh, there, there's this uh, language called Python, which was very popular. And uh, Guido Van Rossum, the guy who created Python, uh, at one point said, you know, I want to make things better. I'm going to make a Python 3000 that's not source compatible with Python. And it was a really big leap. Basically, he just said, I'll just change things. Um, and there was, it just took, I mean, people still won't upgrade, right? Uh, it's just too big of a leap. And, and I have this line, use needles, not machetes. I think what I have discovered about humans is that if you say, here's, here's skull test 3.0, and by the way, uh, for you to upgrade, I'm going to take this hatchet and hack a piece of your you know, leg. Is, would you like to upgrade? You'll say, no, thank you. But if I come with a little needle, I say, eh, you know, there's a few breaks, but it's not too bad. Um, they'll complain and they'll be a little frustrated, but they'll do it. And so I think it's, uh, you know, there, there's a way forward that, it, that it's, it feels very difficult to improve the collections library because it's too, used too widely. But I think there are ways forward. It takes time, but it's not an all at once thing. It's a little bit at a time thing. So, okay. So uh, that's all the preamble. Um, where it first came from, this whole thing, was um, I had come up with an equality type class in uh, Scala test, or for Scala test, but it ended up in Scalactic because it's useful in production code too. And there was one other thing that I needed occasionally and that I saw users requesting from Scala collections um, and not getting, uh, which is on now and then you want to make a set that has a different notion of equality. Um, so it's easy to make a set of strings in Scala standard collections, but if you, what if you don't care about case? You want to have a set of strings where they're, they're sort of case insensitive. Um, what you do uh, is, and what I did, and what I need that, is I create a wrapper class for string, and I call that CIS, which is short for case insensitive string, right? But it's just a wrapper class, and all I do is override equals in hash code. And it has to box because you can't make an any val here. Uh, because with an any value, you can't override equals in a hash code. And here, the whole point is to override equals in a hash code. So I, I just, you can see that the equals method, if it's another case-insensitive string, 
I lowercase both sides and then compare it for equality. In my hash code, I dot lowercase and then call dot hash code. That's all I do. And now if I make a set of case insensitive strings, what you'll see is I put in three, L, uh, three parameters here, lowercase high, uppercase high, and then uh, lowercase high with a space on either side. And if you look at what makes it into the set, only the first one and the third one make it into the set because the second one, uppercase high, looks to this uh, set like it's equal to the first lowercase high because it doesn't care about case, right? So I call that CI set. And that works. Um, it's not efficient maybe because you're boxing, but uh, and, and there's a lot of code you gotta do. And then here's another example. This is WIS, which stands for white space insensitive string. And I've got an equals method that will trim each side before comparing for equality, and the hash code does a trim before calling hash code. Um, so now I can make a set, you know, this is a Scala set of white space insensitive strings, and I put in the th same three parameters, but this time I get the first one and the third one, I'm sorry, the first one and the second one, uh, because it does, it does care about case, so those two look different, unequal, but the third one, after you take the white space out, is equal to the first one, so that one doesn't go in, right? So that's a white space insensitive string set. Okay, so one of the things that you want when you have these different ideas of equality is you want union and hash code, uh, union and intersect and diff to only work on uh, types where not just the same element type, but they have the same notion of equality. So that actually works in this, you know, using this technique. Uh, if I say uh, CI set on top, that's a case insensitive set that we made in the previous slide. If I union it with um, another set of case insensitive strings, I, I, get, the, I get a result. Um, here what I'm missing is the capital HA because it looks like the first lowercase HA. I can union a white, the white space insensitive set I made on the previous slide with this new one. And I, again, I get four elements because the the last one on the end there, the ha with white space, just looks like the first one, right? But if I try to union two sets of string where you know one of them thinks about equality in the case insensitive way, and another one thinks about equality in the white space uh, to intolerant way, or white space trimming way, it doesn't compile. Because which notion of equality would you use, right? Um, so anyway, that's the desired behavior. And so what I wanted to do was come up with a way to use the equality type class to make that nicer. Right, that was sort of my idea. And there was one other, uh, there was one other example of this in the, uh, in the Scala ecosystem, which was I said in Scala Z. And what uh, Scala Z is, is uh, to, to a great extent, inspired by Haskell's way of doing things. And Haskell has something called type class coherence. And so I said is actually, it doesn't capture an equality when you create it. It does use an equal type class. It doesn't use the, the built-in notion of equality in Java like the standard library sets do. But um, what it does is just takes an equal when it needs it. And the, the only way that's gonna work if it's always the same equal. For any type string, you only have one equal of string. And that's, that's how it works in Haskell. Um, and uh, what you do in Haskell if you have something like you want a different equality is you make a new type, like case insensitive string, which is what I just did in the previous one. So now I can make a, I can make an equality type class for case insensitive string, and uh, and that's what type class coherence sort of is all about. Um, but in it's not enforced by the compiler, and in Scala there's actually a way to replace uh, or select or sort of specify this is my type class in this. Uh, scope. Uh, so you can actually change them. You can have an equality of strings that's, that ignores case. And that's used, that's sort of where equality came from in, in Scholactic is because people want to do that in their tests. Um, so it really came from a different tradition. So anyway, they had a, a sort of a, a vigorous argument in this, this GitHub issue about that and type plus coherence won, so it was closed and Daniel didn't win that argument, but I thought he, w you know, what he his argument made sense, and I, I really didn't understand why uh, uh, some of those folks were so gung ho on type class coherence. And I asked them, but they couldn't explain it except by showing me Haskell. But I was like, this isn't Haskell, until I found this talk by Ed Komet. Uh, it's type classes versus the world. Um, you can look it up by by name, 
that's a really good talk and he actually talks about the pros and cons and, and really I finally understood why what what the benefit of type class coherence is that's unrelated to Haskell um, and it, it just it allows you to write more general code so there's pluses and minuses the minuses is that it's kind of clunky in my opinion like uh, there's t two uh, several monoids you could monoid type classes for int that you could imagine two obvious ones are addition and subtraction and what type class coherence says to me is that well there's this addable int type and that's different from this multipliable int type um, it just seems inconsistent with reality really to me I, I think there's something of type int sometimes I want to add them sometimes I want to multiply them so uh, so anyway um, what I I uh, had a, uh, a, a Martin Roderski came to visit uh, I don't know when it was a year ago or something like that and uh, we took him up the mountain that, that's near us and I was mentioning I wanted to do something like you know find a way to use equality not with type class coherence but type and I, I for a while I called it type class incoherence but I, I thought we should remarket it type class abundance because that sounds more positive so to basically use inequality to get this kind of case insensitive set, white space insensitive set thing. And he said, well, you know how I do that? And he described this, this scenario. He said he'd make an object called sets with an S. And, th and then in the context of that, instantiate an inner class. Uh, and then what you get for that is a, a uh, path dependent type. So. I ended up calling it collections, and I'm going to tell you how that happened. Sets obviously have some notion of equality or need some notion of equality because when you put something in, it has to see is it in there already or not. Maps have s their keys in a set, so it also has a notion of equality. So I actually made some maps too in my little, my little trial thing. Um, but then I, I realized that if you look at seek, it has a method called distinct, which eliminates duplicates. And that has a notion of equality. And there's also actually a union uh, intersect and a diff method on seek, which is multi-set union intersect and diff. And that also has a notion of equality baked in. So really, this object that you instantiate isn't just about sets, it's about collections. And, and it, that's how it ended up being a collections library or a, a approach to writing a collections library by accident. Because what I really started out was to like try to just solve this one use case of cus sets with custom equality. And I ended up naming, trying to come up with a name with that thing. And I, and I didn't actually like the names they'd come up with. But collections actually works very nicely. So what you do is you create uh, a new instance of some collections class and you have to give it a type parameter and the type parameter is the equality type so that's the, the type it knows how to compare for equality and you have to pass in an instance of equality of that type so that's the scholastic equality type class and it holds on to reference to that so that's why there's an arrow pointing from the orange circle to the purple circle uh, and what I get is of type collections of whatever the equality type is collections with an S so that's a family of collections of string. So I could make a list of string, I could make a set of string, I could make a hash set of string, I could make a, a map. Well, I can't make a map because it's not a tuple type. But um, that's what it really represents. And the name of the variable I stuck it in is CI, lowercase ci for case insensitive, right? Then what I can do is I can say ci.set, and I don't, it would infer the string if I just stuck hi in there, but I, I put it there just for obviousness. There's a different type, which is the element type of the collection. Because the element type, in this case, string is final, so it's got to be string. But if the equality type was not a final type, then it could be a subtype. Right? So once you have an equality, you can actually compare uh, that type for equality or any subtype of that type. So there's really two types now. There's the equality type, which is the family type, and that's, uh, that's E. And there's the element type of the particular collection you have in your hand, which is T. Okay. And so, um, what, uh, what, uh, you, how you would use it, I've just pulled in something called string normalizations to bring in lowercase and trimmed, and those are just two ways to normalize strings. One of them makes it all lowercase, and one of them trims it. And then you can convert that to a hashing equality, which is a subtype of equality with a hash code method. 
essentially, because you have to have a hash code method for the set. And then I'm basically passing in the quality. So now I have a CI that's this big orange circle, and it's pointing to this purple equality that does that same kind of thing I did in CIS. It calls dot two lowercase on both sides before comparing for equality. That's a case insensitive family. And then I have a white space insensitive one here. So I can just create a, 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 a case insensitive set of strings by saying ci.set, and then I just put strings in there. And you can see it does the same thing. It doesn't put in the second one because that uppercase high, it looks equal to the lowercase high with the, its notion of equality. And I put the same three into the white space insensitive set, and it does the same as before. You get the lowercase and the uppercase, but you don't get the high that's surrounded by white space because that looks the same as the first one. It's equal to the first one. Okay, and then you also get the kind of desired behavior you want where I can actually union a case insensitive set with another case insensitive set. I can union a white space insensitive set with another white space insensitive set, and you'll see that the actual output is the same. Um, but if I try to union a case insensitive set with a white space insensitive set, those guys have two different notions of equality and it doesn't compile. Even though it, the element type of the set is the same, the equality type is different and that's kind of represented by the path. So the part that actually doesn't compile is the CI does not e is not the same as the WI part. Um, the rest of it is the same. It's an immutable uh, set of string in both cases. So so that worked, and, and what was uh, a surprise to me is it wasn't really just about sets. It was really about collections. Okay, so um, the other thing that you may have noticed, I'll back up, is I actually have a plus sign on my set of T. Um, I did make them covariant, and um, I'm gonna talk about why next. So what, uh, they don't have to be covariant, but I thought this is a good opportunity to try that. Uh, and so I'm going to use this family, uh, this inheritance hierarchy, to demo that. Uh, there's a fruit uh, type on top, there's an orange and an apple subclass, and the valencia is a subtype of orange. Okay, so that's what I have. And in the standard library, we have a little inconsistency. Um, seeks are covariant, which means that uh, a seek of orange is a seek of fruit. Um, because orange is a subtype of fruit. So an, a seek of orange, or a list of orange, let's say, is a subtype of list of fruit. Uh, if, because orange is a subtype of fruit, that's covariance. And what uh, it allows me to do is things like this. Um, if I start out with a list of orange, you can see the type down here is list of orange. And I const in an apple in the front. Uh, now I have apple, orange, orange. The type widens to the lowest common supertype, which is fruit. And so that's actually kind of nice. Um, but what isn't nice is if you accidentally stick an, an int in there, which is almost certainly a bug, you don't usually do that on purpose, uh, it actually will widen all the way to any. So there's a, there's a lot of uh, bugs that pass the type checker because of, because of widening to the lowest common super type when it goes all the way to the top. Um, so that's sort of a downside. So I think that line number two is a good thing. Line number three is a bad thing. Like that's sort of a downside. Um, what happened in sets is that they're invariant, they aren't covariant, and what that means is that if I start out with a set of orange and I try to put an apple in it, it that actually doesn't compile. You can't put a set of, you can't put an apple in a set of orange. That would be mass hysteria, right, for sets. Um, so what you have to do is map it and, and, and touch each element and say, actually, I want to think of you as a fruit now, which all you can do is, all you have to do is say, colon fruit, say so I'm going to widen the type to fruit. That's a type, uh, what's that called? A type uh, ascription, right? You can widen it. And um, now on that fruit set, now you can see it comes back as a set of fruit. I can stick an apple in there, of course, because that's a set of fruit and an apple's a fruit. So what's nice about this is if I accidentally stick 88 in my set of oranges, it also doesn't compile. So that's a good thing. But it's kind of, this thing is actually a downside of it because that is verbose code and it also takes time to run at runtime. Uh, so that, that third line there may not be uh, free uh, performance wise. So there's trade-offs going in both directions. Um, and the, the other one I think is that just like a lot of people in the, in the, in the scholar community kind of worry about this and don't like this, 
Um, what I have found when, you, when we teach Scala is that covariance of, of lists is very intuitive to people because if you give, if, if John Pretty asks for a, a bag of fruit and you bring him a bag of apples, he would be satisfied. He would say, thank you, thank you, right? Because a bag of apples is a bag of fruit. It's just intuitive, right? So that makes sense that a list of apples is a list of fruit. And then we tell them that sets aren't covariant and they, they don't, they, why? They ask why. So it's non-intuitive to them. So that's why I kind of lean towards uh, trying to make it consistent. Instead of making them all invariant, I want to see if I can make them all covariant. Um, but the reason, the answer to that question, which we never, I never like bring up, is that, that uh, there's two kinds of sets uh, that are inherently kind of uh, quite different. An intentional set is, is like the set of positive integers. Um, it's something you can express with a function. It, it, it takes an int and returns true or false. Um, an extensional set is a is something where you you just sort of say everything that's in it. And so for the most part, the sets people want are the second one. They want an extensional set. I want to stick stuff in a set and then take things out. And what's in that set is what I've put in it. Um, so what Scala set does, the reason it can't be covariant, is it, it puts those two together because it extends function one and has an apply method. And if you actually try to put a plus sign uh, on Scala set's type parameter, it would say, like complain about that, that apply method, it set, it'll say there's a contravariant, uh, covariant type parameter in a contravariant position. So you have to make it invariant, unless you pull those two apart. So this is what I did, is I, I scalactic set just models extensional, which is like what you want most of the time. Um, and then there's another type called membership, which is the other kind, intentional. And it just wraps a function and adds uh, set methods like union, intersect, and diff. And this is something that uh, Paul Phillips did too in his, uh, he had, uh, when, after he left TypeSafe, he did a collections library. This is another thing that, that he did actually, is split those two out. And I think that, that makes a lot of sense. But what, uh, what I want to say about the covariant thing is that what's different about once you do this and you actually capture a equality type class in a collections instance is the contains method on set and the plus method. I mean, there's a bunch of methods that are going to infer a least common uh, supertype. Has an extra bit of noise up here. Um, what you normally see in Scala collections is u uh, greater than colon t, which means the new collection type. Uh, if I add in, like, a, if I have a set of orange, or a list of orange, and I add in a, uh, uh, an apple, I need a, a type for the output, and it, it's going to be fruit. It has to be some super type of orange, the element type. Um, but the problem that, uh, that we have is that we actually are in this family of collections that only knows how to, to do equality on E. So that is an upper bound. So what, what, we, what is in the Scala collections library is just the lower bound, u greater than colon t. But this has also an upper bound, which is the equality type. And that it stops the, uh, the uh, basically you get the best of both worlds, I think. So <coughs> what I can say, if I make a collections of fruit like this, there is an, that, that you have to pass in a equality of fruit. If I don't give one, it's implicitly passed in the default one. So what default equality is in Scalactic is uh, what it was in Scala test, which is it calls, if it looks and sees if there's arrays on either side, and if there are, it calls dot deep. If, if either side is an array or both sides, it calls dot deep. Then it just calls double equals. So that was default equality. So that's what it is for this. Um, and that just goes in implicitly. So that's what we got. And then if I make a set of of Valencia, I now, if you look at the type here, I get a inhabited set of Valencia. If I uh, add in an orange, it, it does do this widening. It goes up, up the hierarchy to, to orange because that's the least common super type. Now I have a set of orange that has both an orange and a Valencia in it. If I instead add to the original Valencia set an apple, it widens it to fruit because that's apples over here and it hops over orange and goes, it finds fruit, right? That's the least common super type in this case. Um, so I think that's actually quite nice, um, but what it doesn't do, yes? Can I ask a question? Sure. Okay, so um, the plus 
has the orange or the apple or the argument in quantum variant position. Yes. How does that work? How can you make your set covariant with the argument in quantum variant position? Um, it's actually because it, uh, you have a U. So T is, I don't say T, I say I'm going to come up with a set of U, and U has to be a supertype of T. That's that trick of. And you do the same for contains? Yep. I All see. of those methods have this, this threesome here. Okay. Whereas normally in Scala collections, in like seeks, because they're covariant, you just have the U greater than colon T. And in, okay. in Scala set, because it's invariant, you just have T. Yeah. So, um, which. It is probably time for D here in England. Okay, but check this out. The next line, I'm going to add 88. It doesn't infer any. Right, so I get this nice widening in the fruit family, but if I put in an 88, what it does is it slams against the upper bound and stops because the upper bound is fruit. And what the error says is the type U that I need to infer for the new set has to be not just a supertype of Lancia, but also a subtype of fruit. And it's fruit is that equality type, and if I, if I were to go above that, I wouldn't know how to do equality for it, and I couldn't really make a set, right? So that's why I, I discovered that. It's like, wow, that's pretty nice, because it sort of gives you the best of both worlds, I think. Um, it's not perfect, because if you can still ask a set of orange, if it contains an apple, it will compile and say false, right? So within the, you know, between the, where you are and the upper bound, you still have that problem. Um, but anyway, I thought that was uh, 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 nice because what you can do, like a set of string, if you actually want to turn it off completely, you can just make a collections family of the exact type you're using, and that is the upper bound. The upper bound, lower bound, the same. It will never, it's almost like it's invariant, even though it's covariant. So, um, just real quick, what membership looks like, it's uh, just wraps a function. So I make a membership, and here this is uh, even ints. Um, I bitwise anded with one, if that's uh, equal to zero, that's even. And that's supposed to be the most efficient way to check. So then I can say even ints dot complement, and I just get, now I've got the audience membership. And it's another kind of set, but I didn't want to call it set. Um, just for, just to keep that, uh, it's an intentional set. So if I say even ints zero, even ints one, it's true, false. If I say odd ints zero, odd ints one, it's false, true. And then I could un you can union intersect and diff these things because they're like set concepts. Uh, so if I union even ints with odd ints then, and say all ints zero and all ints one is true true. Um, and the neat thing about this is it's actually contravariant. Um, so that's the other reason I like covariant sets is that you've got extensional sets here. They're kind of naturally covariant. And you've got intentional sets here and they're kind of naturally contravariant. So I sort of felt like that was symmetric. Um, but if I have a membership of any val, where it takes an any val and says, is this an int? If it's an int, I'm going to return false. Oh, no, I'm going to return false, because it's not a non-int, sorry. <laughs> I started to sound like false naively. But uh, if it's a not a not a not, not int, then <laughs> you can use De Morgan's theorem. No, anyway, uh, so if I say non-ints of one, you get false, because that is an int. It's not a non-int. <laughs> If I say non ints of a double, you get true, because that's not an int. So the reason I used any value was so I could show that you can actually widen this to membership of int, but you can't widen it to membership of any, because that's actually not uh, a supertype. Um, so it's, it's contravariant, because uh, even though int is a subtype of any val, uh, membership of int is a supertype of membership of any val. It's the other way around. So that's contravariant. OK. So. Um, <laughs> The other thing that fell out of this that surprised me is I thought, you know, most of the time, 99%, 99.8% of the time, maybe 99.9% of the time, the, the equality baked into the types you're using, the double equals method, is what you want, right? And so it's really practical to use Scala collections, and every now and then when you need a custom equality, you make a wrapper type. And, you know, maybe now and then that's, that's uh, important, it, you know, doesn't perform well enough and you have to deal, I don't know how, but it's really not that big of a problem. Um, but because I had this default equality notion, I, I made a default collections, and I just say collections are default there. I wanted to show you what it is. It's a collections of any, 
So it's a family of collections where the equality type is any. It's that default equality. It knows how to compare anything. It, if it's, it looks at the sides, if there's an array, I call dot uh, uh, deep. And otherwise, I just call double equals. Right? That's default equality. So I can do that for anything. So I have a collections of any. And if I import that, and you start using that set of collections, it's, it's, it just feels, looks and feels like the standard library. So the standard library's approach is kind of like a, it is like a simple case. It's just like an instance of this, this class of collections family, right? It's the default family. So I can just say uh, d set, default set, uh, put all those things in. And of course, they all go in because they're different based on default equality, which is what this one is. And if I try to stick 88 in there, it actually works just like the standard libraries collections. Um, you get a, a, you know, a set of any, which is not nice. And by the way, the other way I think this can be fixed is with static analysis. SuperSafe does that, where if you bring in a, the plugin, the SuperSafe plugin, it will give you a compiler error on this one. Um, so it's, it's not in the type system, uh, but it's a way you can have covariance and the type error. So the other way to do it is just make things invariant, uh, which it, you know, gets rid of that problem, but it also has, it requires you to do the mapping, uh, which I think is a trade-off. So. Anyway, um, the other thing is, now what do I do about map and flat map? And this took me a while to figure out. Uh, because I, if I map a case insensitive set to an int set, well, I don't actually have an equality of int. I've got this custom equality of strings. Which one do you want me to map it to? So I really couldn't do map um, until I realized I could make it lazy. So uh, what all those methods that transform collections do is they immediately go to a lazy a view. And so if you can see the output of uh, underscore dot length, I'm just gonna get the length of the string. Uh, I just get a fast set view because that actually is a type fast set. And uh, it has two and four because there's the, the lowercase high and the lowercase high with two spaces. Um, when I do the white space insensitive set, do the same thing, I get two, two. Now this is a set view, it's not a set, so I actually preserve all the elements until you force it. Um, so you can make a functor for that and it would work perfectly fine. You can't really get a good functor for set because it doesn't preserve elements across map, but uh, you can do a functor for that if you like to do that sort of thing. And then what I did, because I figured most people would use standard or default collections 99% of the time, is just force does what it does in the standard library, which is goes to the default collections family. Um, you just get a default collection. So here is where uh, you become back to a set because now I've, when I say dot force that means default collections dot default which is default equality. I know how to make an equality events from that and I can say well two is, is equal to two so I'll just put it in once. Right? So that's where it, it sort of uh, comes back. And then um, this one, I just map it to another string, so I put exclamation points on it. This is the white space insensitive set. Uh, so I have of hi, and if you didn't hear me, hi more loudly right there. Uh, if I force it, it goes into the standard or the default family. But if I want to go into back into the white space insensitive one, I can do so by just saying force into. And now you've got to give a reference to a collections instance. And it can be any collections instance. So I force it into this family. And so I say force into wi, I get a uh, wi.immutable inhabited seek. So it's a white space insensitive one. Um, I could also force it into a case insensitive one, which notes it, it, it dropped the capital high exclamation point because that looks the same after you eliminate case. So, um, so one nice other thing uh, about that is that can build from goes, it, it shows up very rarely. Um, in, in the strict types, like set, not set view, um, I just use, I override the method and I make the subtype more specific. So map, well not map, um, uh, well I can't think of an example, but essentially um, if something uh, is to return the same type, like uh, s set, if you have a subtype, you can make that a subtype of set. You're allowed to make that a, a, a subtype. That's covariant return types. So I just override. And that means I don't need can build from to get that, like if you map a set, you get a set. If you map a hash set, you get a hash set. If you map a list, you get a list kind of thing. Um, 
And then, of course, actually, our transformation methods return views, so I just go to the view. There's no can build from needed there. I just go exactly to that specific view, and I have one view per, per collection type. And um, I also have reduced inheritance quite a bit. I think there's too much inheritance. It's slightly overused in the standard library, so I, I'm seeing what I can get rid of. Um, and I don't usually need it in views either. So the place it would show up is in the force methods. Um, and really, I think the only place I need it is map, because uh, map, big M map. Because if you map a map, little m map, a big M map, to another type that is also a tuple type, tuple two, then you can get a new map back, big M map. But if it's any other type, non-tuple two, then uh, I can't, and so you need something like can build from to implicitly discover, oh, if I'm starting with a map and the output isn't a tuple two, then I should go to iterable or something. So it's really the only place it shows up is the, the force and force into methods for the map views. And so I think that makes it things a lot uh, simpler for, for people, I think. Um, but it is the right, and I mean, it's the right way to do that. I like that feature of like hopping up, like you, you always get back what you start with, but it may not be the exact type, it might be a little more general. Like if you can't make a map, it'll go up its hierarchy to the, one, the first one you can. Um, and then there is no bit set. Uh, can anybody guess why? It has nothing to do with can build from. Why, is there, why would I not have a bit set in this? Negative numbers. That's a puzzle for me. No, I don't think so. That's yeah. What do you do with negative numbers in bit set? I don't know. I think the bit set cannot represent negative numbers. So yeah, I we have positive integers in a bit set. So yeah, we have a set of integers which contains negative numbers in a bit set. Yeah, that's actually that may be another reason, but that wasn't the reason I I had. Um, the reason I had is they have a bit set has a baked-in notion of equality. So the whole idea here is that I can cut, put in a custom equality of int. Bit set would never use it because it says, oh, something, two things are equal if both the bits are set. So you can't change it. So it would have to be outside this collections thing. So anyway, bit set was another place where can build from showed up. Um, so just some other things, some odds and ends. I just, when I first wrote the book, I actually drew that diagram. Uh, and I thought, well, this is really kind of elegant, you know, you've got set on top and it's in scala.collection and that's the one where it may either be immutable or mutable. And then you've got these two subtypes, also named set, which works in scala, it's practical because you can import package names and things like that. Um, and then you have two hash sets that are immutable or mutable. But it turned out uh, that I never used the top one because I want to know if something's immutable or mutable. I really don't, I have no use for this top one. So I wanted to see if I can get rid of it. So that's a big, that's pretty, pretty drastic. So that's what, uh, that's one thing I'm trying to do to get rid of inheritance. And another one is, is, uh, is the view stuff. Um, there's no, like in, in Scala standard library, seek view extends seek. Uh, and it's, um, it just makes it a lot harder to mess around with views. Uh, and it just, I don't think is necessary. Um, what I am gonna try is to see if I can get away with for each type x, there's an x view. And it's sort of a transient helper class. When you want to do something, t I mean, Scala is strict. So it's, you know, we work with strict collections. And then to, to do some transformations on them efficiently, we can do dot map, dot flap, dot map, dot da 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 da, dot force. And so this, this in between thing is, is not really something you would pass around much. So that, I'm going to try that, see if I can get away with that. But, uh, you know, Currently, there is a hash set view because we have a hash set. There's a set view because we have a set. But hash set view does not extend set view currently. They're just different. Um, OK. So there was one other thing I, I wanted to mention about, um, about this that I did differently in the view classes. Uh, and that is I actually, you can see there's set view of int. So in the standard library, there they take two type parameters. One of them is a higher kind of type, I think, or it, it's a type constructor. So you, so you see set int, set view int comma list, because uh, they want to reuse code. They don't want to duplicate code. Um, and then they don't tell you what's in it, because this is lazy, so why would I, why would I actually do that for, for calling two string? Why would I evaluate it? Um, it's too soon, and, but I think you should evaluate, because if this is, if map's lazy, 
if we're going to teach this, I have to show people when I map something what the output is. And I think when you are going to want to see the two string is in test results, test errors, uh, uh, log messages like this where you're using the REPL or, or debug print lines. Right? In all those cases, it's okay to evaluate it. So that's, that's one difference, I think. And, and you could just already do that in the standard library if you want it would make it better, I think. Um, okay. So um, the one place I did add inheritance is, is I made a package called inhabited and I model uh, whether or not something is inside there. So I'll do a quick demo. If I say CI set hi uh, ha like this, um, and I add, well, actually, like this, I can just uh, ci dot set. Let me get the, put the dot in there. This is um, ci is the path, so you have to say dot. So now I get a ci dot set uh, with hi and ha. And if I take ha out, because no one's laughing, I'll remove the ha from my. my now to, notice the type went from inhabited set to set because when you subtract something, I don't know, I can't prove it's compile time that it has anything in it. Um, it m inhabited just means it definitely has something in it. Regular, uh, uh, let's go back to this guy, that's res42, right? Res42 just has high end, let's add something in it. Pl plus uh, ho, and now it's back to inhabited, because when you plus something in there, it definitely is gonna be non-empty. So I think that actually is pretty simple. And, and then if you like call Res42 is, uh, you know, dot head, it, like head and tail and, and uh, uh, reduce methods that would always blow up if it's an empty collection just aren't there on the general one. And it's really not big of a deal. You, there's other thing, there's other, like if you want to call reduce, just call fold in that case. Um, and, th but if you go to like res41, which is inhabited uh, and call head, it works. Head and you spell it right. So anyway, I, that feels okay too. It adds, you know, the downside is it adds a bunch more types. They're like this, it's the same name uh, and you've got another package. So that's, that's a sort of a downside, but uh, it just seems to kind of work. Um, but if somebody wants a set, you can also send them an inhabited set because it's a subtype. Okay. And then the, the last thing I wanted to say was that um, I, the other thing I find with a standard library is that there, historically I got the feeling that there were a lot of different people uh, working on it, uh, some grad students working on it. Um, there was a lot of inconsistency. There were a lot of bugs. There was a lot of duplication. Um, and so they were trying to make it manageable. And so if you look at the linearization of lists, there's like 500, <laughs> I mean it's not 500, but there's a gazillion types in there and it's just really overwhelming. What I want to try to do is just have types in the public API that users would actually use and not expose any types that make implementation more convenient for myself, um, which is hard, but um, I think it will make it simpler for people. And um, the way I would prevent bugs and code duplication is not be afraid to use code gen if it's helpful and test it. So I wanted to show you a t something I, from the skull test uh, documentation, uh, which is in, I think it's, yeah, it's the documentation for prop spec. And, and it shows one way of, of implementing a test matrix, which is along the, and I use sets actually for my example, um, years ago, each column is, a, is an implementation of set and each row is a property that all sets should have. Um, and what this will do is it'll go through and, and make sure everything, every cell is tested and if you add a new column or add a new row and forget to sort of test one of those cases, it won't compile. It won't compile until you have a, every cell filled in. And I think that's what you really need to do for something like the, the collections library. You need to actually have these kinds of test matrices and just test them uh, to get things working. So that is my talk. Um, do any questions or do we have time for questions? <laughs> your, your theme is over, Bill. Okay. But if there's no questions, then... Yes, one question, um, Rudiger. You are um, putting the... Basically, you are taking type class from the outside and putting them in the collective family. Uh, I have done this too a few times. 
uh, but one thing that is nice about type class based approach is that uh, you only need to pull in the type class that you actually need. So, for example, if you do an operation that requires order, you um, only then you need the order instance. And Adrian, uh, you can come up here and set up. Operations for which you don't even need the EQ ins uh, yeah. inputs instance. So, yep. Yeah. Uh, I think for me, it, uh, well, I thought it might be better to have the typeless instance. Right. Only require the typeless instances on the operations. Correct. And not on the. Like yes, that's the whole type class coherence. So I'll repeat what he said, and he's he's basically talking about the benefit of type class coherence, which is you, you only take what you need when you need it, and it makes it actually is better. Uh, in, in, in it's more you, your code is more general and you uh, because like if uh, there's there's methods in monad transformers that take functor because they don't actually need to be a monad like map whereas if you capture the monad then it has to be a monad right so it that's that's the benefit of type class coherence so what I they, there's already people kind of doing that that way I, I wanted to see what would happen if we did it the other way but there's pluses and minuses in both both approaches uh, but anyway, is Adrian here? Because he's the next guy. Well, come on up. Come on up. Uh, I can uh, I can ask one one more question if there is one while he sets up. Oh, I, it's going to take thirty seconds. Okay. Uh, it has to be a yes or no question. <laughs> Quickly. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you.